One thing I do like about the read-in is it's very informal. And we get to have a lot of fun here. And I hope you are inspired today. I'd like to thank Vera for bringing our, her class. And we have our students over here. This is the VIP section for our students. Let's give them a round of applause. This is for you, your takeaway. Uh, at this time, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Ms. Renee Washington to step forward. And I would like to ask everyone to stand. She is going to do the African American National Anthem. Ms. Washington. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the presence has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. You may be seated. Thank you. I have a few things I'd like to share with you as it relates to why we're here today. But first of all, I want to thank you because it is my distinct honor to greet you once again for our 23rd annual African American Read-In. I do hope that you've had an opportunity to attend some of the events that we've planned for you this month as we pay contribution to the achievements of black American history in this country. Our program theme for today is the poetry of justice. And I think poetry and the expectation of justice can be found in the lyrics that, you know, trace all the way back to the old Negro spirituals or the protest in your face music that we heard that was sampled earlier this month. Action poetry, when applied under the right circumstances, can influence decisions which may result in a new law being passed or to help a falsely accused prisoner to gain public attention. For example, in 1975, when singer-songwriter and social activist Bob Dylan wrote a song about Reuben the Hurricane Carter, look it up, you can Google it, the people listened. Reuben Carter was falsely tried. The crime was murder one. Guess who testified? Bellow and Bradley, and they both baldly lied. And the newspapers, they all went along for the ride. How can the life of such a man be in the palm of a fool's hand? To see him obviously framed couldn't help but make me feel ashamed to be in a land where justice is a game. Wow, now all the criminals in their coats and their ties are free to drink martinis and to watch the sunrise. While Reuben sits like Buddha in a 10-foot cell, an innocent man in a living hell. That's the story of the hurricane. But it won't be over until they clear his name. Eventually, Reuben, the Hurricane Carter, he was free. Poetry and justice. In 1989, Frankie Beverly's poetic lyrics, Mandela crossed international waters. Mandela, Mandela, when will they set you free? Why it has taken so long is a mystery. We've got the power to help you in your time of need. When will they do what is right so the world can see? I know we can do it. We can make a difference. We've got to come to it because it just don't make no sense. That's profound. 
I'm tired of talking because it's got to be a way for the people. Freedom's going to come someday. Mandela, Mandela, freedom's on the way. On February 11, 1990, Nelson Mandela was released from prison. Another example, in 1981, Stevie Wonder composed a poetic song as part of an effort to have MLK's birthday recognized as a national holiday. I just never understood how a man who died for good could not have a day that would be set aside for his recognition. Because it should never be just because some cannot see the dream as clear as he, that they should make it become an illusion. And we all know everything that he stood for in time would bring, for in peace our hearts would sing thanks to Martin Luther King. Happy birthday. The time is overdue for people like me and you who know the way to truth is love and unity for all of God's children. It should be a great event, and the whole day should be spent in full remembrance of those who lived and died for the oneness of all people. So let us all begin. Let it out, don't hold it in. Sing as loud as you can. Happy birthday to you. On November 2nd, 1983, President Ronald Reagan signed a bill making Martin Luther King Day a federal holiday. Song lyrics, technically, but poetry impacting justice. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, help me welcome your reading hostess, Miss Chanel. Oh, good morning, everybody. Everybody looks good. I hate to stand behind the podium because it makes me nervous. How is everybody doing? Great. Well, once again, back by popular demand, the African American Read-In. I am Chanel Dunn Clark, your host for today. And I would like to just give a thank you to Brenda and the whole committee. Every year she invites me back. And every year I wonder why. But I thank you. I really enjoy this. Um, I guess what we can go ahead and do and just start our, uh, our first reader. Are you guys ready? You guys, are you guys okay? Relax. It's okay. We're not at a funeral or anything. It's good. It's good. Relax. Wow. All right. Y'all ready? All right. Our first reader will be Kendrick Pulliam. He's from the district. Well, I guess his position is district organizational process analyst. Wow. That's a lot, isn't it? What does that really mean? Come on. Come on. To, as you walk into the podium, tell us what that means. Wow, that's wonderful. All right, you go right ahead. I don't know if this, there it is. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I just decided to come over from my lunch break. Uh, I'll be reading excerpts from a book called Witness to the Truth, My Struggle for Human Rights in Louisiana. And the book is very important to me because it was written by my grandfather. Uh, actually, excerpts from papers and interviews that he did uh, as he struggled after the Civil War, after Reconstruction, to gain the right to vote in, in Northeast Louisiana. Uh, so uh, we were blessed for him to be able to record a lot of his words, and in 2003 it was actually published into a book uh, with the help of one of my aunts, uh, Cleo Scott Brown. So uh, in case you, if you didn't know, uh, you know, after slavery and the Civil War, uh, they went through this period of called Reconstruction where you had a lot of African Americans who were able to vote, but uh, systematically through the Jim Crow system, the, uh, the right to vote was taken away. And in the parish, which county parish, same thing in Louisiana, where my grandfather lived, no one had voted, no African American had voted 
uh, since the since Reconstruction, which was 1870, and he didn't get the right to vote until 1968. Uh, so it had been that period of time. So uh, the first excerpt I'm going to read is from the beginning of the book, and it kind of chronicles as he was, uh, and, and on, on an August night in 1962, as he was driving home with his family from church, he was a, a Baptist minister, uh, there was a, a, some Ku Klux Klan members who rode up on the side of his car and shot up his car. So I'm reading the excerpt. This is what he uh, kind of penned immediately after uh, the incident. I reached over to touch the throbbing spot on my left arm as I ran fast as I could through the, along the dark highway. Warm blood was already starting to flow through the strips of fabric that just a few minutes ago had been asleep in my favorite dress shirt. My mind told me that I'd better find a hiding place fast, so I ran down the steep embark embankment toward the cotton field that bordered the highway. As I glanced back in the direction I had come, I caught sight of the headlights of a slow-moving car. It was the same car. It had to be the same car. The headlights were shaped the same as the car that had trailed us from the town. I ducked into the cotton field, crouching down between the cotton stalks, my heart racing, every beat pounding in my ears. The ditch was deep, and it was pretty dark, but I worried that they might still be able to see my white shirt in the moonlight. I figured they were inching along, peering into the darkness, looking for my car, trying to see if I had lost control and turned over in the ditch when they had shot into it as they passed earlier. Then, and even worse, then an even worse thought struck me. Maybe they were looking to see if they needed to finish the job. Maybe they wanted to make sure that we were all dead, my wife, my children, and me. As I tugged at my bow tie, struggling to get my breath, words I had told myself through the years came rushing back to me, repeated over and over in my mind. A cause worth fighting for is a cause worth dying for. A cause worth fighting for is a cause worth dying for. I was 60 years old, and for the first time in my life, I felt the full weight and implication of these words. Then just as suddenly, it was as if a window of knowledge opened to me. It became clear on that muggy August night in 1962 that sometimes plain and ordinary people are given extraordinary jobs to do, and they are blessed with the skills and courage necessary to do them. I have been in preparation for this time all of my life. All of my experiences, both the bad and the good, taken along together, have made me ready for the work I have been assigned to do. But surely without my life's experiences, they would have broken me. I feel compelled to put my life story on paper to be shared with generations to come. I am old now, but the Lord has blessed me with a very good memory, and I believe he has reserved my memory for a great purpose. I must start my story at the beginning of my life, because so much of what will become depends on how we start. Our conditions and circumstances are not for our own choosing, so we, either, we are either made or broken by what we are given. And he also went on to pen what he called uh, our eyes to the future. And uh, this is after, this is in 1980, where the uh, parish had designated the day, uh, Reverend John H. Scott Day, uh, as a proclamation by the mayor, and, and there was uh, hundreds of townspeople who showed up. And so he wrote this. This was the speech that he gave on that day. Many, many years have passed since the momentous day in the 1960s when a black person was finally elected to public office in East Carroll. The town has changed greatly over the years. Most of the young people, including my own children, moved away to bigger cities where they could find good-paying jobs and better living conditions than could be found in a poor rural community. Though some victories have been won, there is no time for slowing the fight for equality. In wars, you win the battle, then you take time to establish your position and hold on to what you have. In battles, territories not freely given can and generally will be taken back if you don't remain vigilant. As I look back and reminisce about those dark years when we groped our way I rem I'm reminded that, I'm reminded of what the great prophet Jeremiah said, walking with God in the dark, still you are not walking alone. Your God can show you the way. So we walked across the, 
across the years on God's strength until we finally came into the light. Not because we could see the light in the distance. Not because we had a path laid out to follow. Not because someone had given us an instruction book. We were able to walk because we believed in someone greater than mankind. I walked because God had made me known that one person could make a difference in a town, a state, or a country when that person could see possibilities out of impossibilities. All of us have been on a journey together, but my journey must soon end. As we are fast approaching a fork in the road, I have been struggling with prostate cancer for some time, and my doctor has recently advised me that I should be gone from this place within the next six months. So as we come to the fork, I must take one side and you must take the other. I have asked my children to come back home so that we can talk, so that we can, so that we can make sure nothing is left unsaid, so that I can remind them of the lessons I wanted them to always remember and share with their children and their communities. I used to say all the time, when God created the Negro, he created a beautiful bouquet with all our different shades of colors. Now that was how I looked at my family, as a beautiful bouquet, all from one family, but all very much individuals in their own right. They had a pursued different careers and lived in different cities and different states. The bouquet, the bouquet included a minister, a marriage counselor, a master electrician. He must have gotten his talent from his mother. A lawyer, a daycare center owner, a mental health professional, a college professor, an auditor, and a civil servant. Three had completed their master's degrees. One had a law degree, and one was working on her master's. One daughter would complete her requirements for her doctoral degree in only a couple of months. My wife had even gone back to school after most of the children moved away, and she now managed a local daycare center. That's a lesson right there. It's never too late to go back and finish school and pursue your dreams. She always loved children and teaching, so now she gets to do both of these every day. As, the, as some of the children made their, way in a, in, made their way in, arriving at different times from Illinois, Texas, New Jersey, North Carolina, and several parts of Louisiana, I sat and pondered what were the most important things I had learned in life. What instructions and directions should I leave behind? Many things flowed through my mind, but I settled on a few that I, would, that I thought were most important. These are the things I jotted down to share with my children and to pass on to anyone reading my words. First, God is the foundation. Everything else is built on that foundation. God is the source of strength, wisdom, and vision. Without him, I would have never survived. I would have quit the fight or would have been killed a long time ago. But he gave me the courage and strength to go on. It's a personal relationship with God that makes the difference. Truth and open communication should come next. In the late 1960s, after the burnings and killings stopped and the buses and restaurants, stores and schools were integrated, I used to think that after a while, blacks and whites would forget about color, about the color of their skin, and they were going to all unite and work together. It was only later that I began to see the signs that the new peace and harmony between the races wouldn't last. It took some studying, but I finally figured out what the problem was. We had tried to build a future without first dealing with the past. So that is why I put communication and truth near the top of the list. A law passed in the 1960s to make discrimination illegal, but there was little dialogue and few changes to the history books or education of the masses meant to change the hearts of man. And because the hearts were not changed, you can see today reflections in our children of the anger, resentment, racial bias, and hatred, and worst of all, the blindness to discrimination that so controlled the parents of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So I say to anybody of any race who says, leave the past in the, in, the, in the past, that no problem has ever been solved by ignoring it. The issue separating the races and leading to discrimination and dislike will be passed from generation to generation until black people and white people start to talk honestly about the long-term impact of slavery, and even more important, the impact of Jim Crow laws. Finally, may God bless all who read and listened to my story, and may his light shine upon you that the complicated may be, plain, may, may be made plain. There's something very important to be done, and you may be the one of the chosen for such a time as this. What will you do today that will make a difference for the good? So I say goodbye to you all who choose to, walk, who choose to take a little walk through time with an old man. Thank you. was wonderful. Kendrick, and who did you say was the author of that book? That's what I thought. Wow. Um, you said something that, that really touched my heart. Wow, a cause worth fighting for, 
and I'm going to get with you later to get the rest of that. And also, you said a person can make a difference when there is a purpose. That's, that's absolutely true. That was absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed that. Um, I'm definitely going to have to get those words from you so I can just kind of keep them in my memory. Did you guys enjoy that? That was wonderful. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Next, coming to the podium is Mary Akers. She's from the Business Diversity Department. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm a administrative assistant for the Department of Business Diversity, and I'm also an adjunct. I, uh, I used to at uh, Eastfield, now I've moved on to El Centro. But since we live in a world today where women still struggle uh, among uh, sexism and racism, I um, found a book years ago, um, Aren't I a Woman, written by uh, Deborah Gray White, that I thought uh, the, the excerpt in it really kind of described uh, who we are and where we came from. Uh, Sojourner Truth is who I'm going to be talking about um, real quickly. I don't have anything as long as uh, my, uh, the person before me, but this short little excerpt meant a lot to me. Um, and it says, when Sojourner Truth took the podium at Akron, Ohio William, Women's Rights Convention, she was greeted with boos and hisses. It was 1851, just nine years before the civil rights debacle. And in the minds of many, the infant feminine movement was linked to the threatening abolition crusade. For truth, both racism and sexism mediated against the democracy with which Americans had become comfortable. Yet a former slave, a black, and a woman, Sojourner Truth made many Americans uncomfortable. Issues concerning slavery and blacks or female status seems to be tearing apart the nation's fabric. And some Americans could not look at, much less listen to, uh, Saturn of Truth without being reminded of the nation's woes. Truth supporters uh, secured her a place on the program, and her first, very first sentence served notice that she would talk about women's rights without ignoring the equally controversial topic of the abolition of slavery. She said, well, children, what right there is so much racket that must be something out there killed. I think just between, in the words, the, the niggas of the South and the women of the North, all the talking about rights, that white men will be in the fixing pretty soon. She said, having lynched her indictment of the status quo, Truth proceeded to draw on her own slave experience to demonstrate how slavery and racism made a mockery of the logic upon which uh, sex discrimination was based. She says, uh, uh, that man over there say that women needs to be lifted over ditches and have to the, the, had the right place everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into no carriages or the, helped me over mud paddles or give me any place. And aren't I a woman? She said, uh, look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and I have planted. I, grat, uh, I gathered into the barns and no man could head me. And aren't I a woman? I could work as much as a man and eat as much as a man when I could get it. And I bear the lashes well. And aren't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen them most all sell, sold off in slavery. And when I cried out with the mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And aren't I a woman? Sojourner Truth went on to approve the, law, the males in her audience for withholding rights from her mother's sisters and wives, but she had, al had already made her point. Her life stood in stark contrast to that of most 19th century white American women. 
the safety of a pedestal, questioned as it was, had not been extended to her. She, like most black women of the time, plowed, planted, hoed, did as much work as a man, endured the brutal punishment meted out by slaveholders and their overseers, and also fulfilled her ordained role of motherhood. Judged by her life experience, all theories of inequality based on the assumption that women were weaker than men and that their physical and mental constitution suited them only for domestic duties was false. In fact, perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps more than any group of American women, black women, particularly slaves, prove daily that sexual discrimination based on such assumption, assumptions was, was not justified. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Aren't I a woman? Wow. That was great. As I was sitting there listening to you, aren't I a woman? I was thinking to myself, I can relate to that. Because in so many situations, I've had to ask myself that. Walking into a grocery store and seeing men go in before me and just let the door fall in my face, I had to ask myself the same question. Ain't I a woman? That's what I said. I know that's not a word, but I did say it. I am a woman. I know y'all saw me. Wow, that was great. Before we go into the next reader, we would like to play a trivial game with you just, to, just for some more fun and just to, not to test you, just to see if you're listening and just to see just how much you really know. Are you ready? All right. Okay. We do have prizes to the ones that answer the questions. Okay. In 1783, John Durham became one of the country's first successful black physicians. What was his specialty? His specialty was throat Wait, disorders. Oh, you oh, knew I, it? I thought we had a hand over there coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Did she answer correctly? Uh, I told him. <laughs> oh. OK, okay. let's do one. This is, this, this is, a, mm -hmm. this is an easier one. Who was the first African American to serve in the Texas Senate since 1883? Yes. <laughs> we got an answer back over here too. Uh, let me say this: If you win. You have to give your student ID number, so see me afterwards, and I'll get that done. Oh, okay, it's only for students. Okay, in, in 1968, did Ralph Abernathy lead, lead the Poor People March, or did he march on Washington? I'm going to read it again. In 1968, did Ralph Abernathy Lead the Poor People's March or the March on Washington? Yes, sir. He led the Poor People's March. <laughs> okay. He changed his mind. Okay. One more. One more. Okay. Let me let me pick one that. Okay, this is an easy one as well. Name the ragtime pianist and composer who wrote Maple Leaf Rag and The Entertainer. Come on, you know I know we have some history majors in here. That's correct. Right, let's give them a hand clap. All right. You get a prize. Okay, that was fun. You ready for your prize? Okay, great. As long as you have your ID. Our next own Eastville College professor 
is Mike Morris. Please come to the podium. First time I'm trying to read this off the of iPad, it goes wambly wambly while I'm walking. A teacher says, without a vision, the people perish. And that's, uh, I think of the word vision when I think about the word justice, because it, uh, a lot about what we think is right or wrong, what is just and unjust happens uh, basically uh, because of what we see or what we think we see when we are looking at other people and other groups. And I've chosen a poem by Rita Dove. And one of the reasons I chose Miss Dove is because she's alive, and I want to remind you, poetry is still alive. It didn't die when my grandfather stopped going to school. Uh, she was the second African-American woman to be named Poet Laureate of the United States. Second, not first. She won, uh, also the second to win the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry for a book called Thomas and Beulah, loosely based on her mother and father and their courtship. Uh, the poem I'm going to read for you is called Lines Composed on the Body Politic and Accounting. It sounds very scholarly, a little bit more scholarly than I would have intended, but uh, it has a lot to do with uh, how we envision other people and how we envision ourselves and what role that has to play in, in justice. Less than the charting of each dawn's resolutions, less than each evening's trickle of doubt, less than the crown's weight in silver, a diamond scratch against glass, less than the touted ill luck of my rich beginnings, and yet more than Eve's silence, my mute ingratitude. More than music's safe passage, its rapturous net. More than this stockpile of words, their liquid solicitude. More desired than praise, the least prized of my dreams. Less real than dreaming, castle keep for my sins. More than no more, which seems much less than hoped for. Again, one mutiny quelled. One wish lost, a forgotten treasure to live without scrutiny beyond constant measure. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was wonderful. Wow, we do perish without a vision. That is so true. Thank you for that. That was a great presentation. Our next Read-in will be presented by Michael Ford. He is an Eastfield College student, Keys to Freedom. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Ford. Like she said, I'm a student here at Eastfield. And uh, uh, I wanted to also thank Ms. Turnbow. Where is Ms. Turnbow? OK, I wanted to thank Ms. Turnbow for including me in this. I feel honored. And then when they said this, if this is annual, I was like, well, this is cool. I didn't know it was around. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get to my poem. I don't want to take too long, but uh, I want to give a background to let y'all know what the poem is about. It's called Key to Freedom. And it's a poem that I wrote back when I was in high school. And one of the reasons why I called it Key to Freedom because as black people, I think we all have a duty and an obligation to try and be something for the simple fact that, you know, there was a time when slaves, they were born into slavery, and they knew that that's what they were going to die they were going to die into slavery. And, um, I, and my mom always tells me, there's nothing new under the sun, meaning if you have a dream as a black person or as anybody, there's probably a slave that probably had that same dream. You know? And no matter what dream you have, it should, it should resonate with you to try and do that all the more because you know, as you were doing it, you know, you're doing it for that slave person who didn't get a chance to, too. Um, uh, what else was I going to say with that? Uh, oh, I forget. It, 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 it's, it's leaving me. But, I mean, the poem's right here. So I'm going to just go ahead and dive on into the poem. And what I was also going to say is that this. You don't have to just be black either. I mean, all of us have somebody in our family with a maybe, or we know, with a mental challenge. 
and you look at that person and you think, oh, that could have been me. Or, and you know, you have more of a duty and an obligation to try and be something because that person in your family, you know, doesn't get that same opportunity as you. And at the same time, my mom, she had a second set of twins. I'm a twin, but they died at birth. And almost everything we do, like passwords, is in their names. Passwords and stuff that we do, we always keep their name alive. And so when we do stuff, me and my twin brother, it's almost like, you know, our younger twin brothers that didn't get to live, they're doing it too. So this is the, this is the poem. I'm going to go ahead and dive right into it. It's called Key to Freedom. And I want you to think about it too. You know, if you're doing something, you know, it's also that slave, you know, and it probably, it should make you think, oh, this means a little bit more. Okay. This is for that slave who never had the right. Awaking each day in chains all the way to the night. Born in fear and pain. And whose death looked the same. Don't know home or why to this place they came. This is for that slave that was, but not that which he wanted to be. Who never had a key to his freedom who couldn't even dream of being somebody. Whatever dream he had was chained. And even if it wasn't, he'd wake up and realize he was and couldn't chase it. This is for that slave who slept without a dream, who died or was without really living or being. He lives in me. I am his key. Together, somebody, we will be. Thank you. Wow, Michael, that was awesome. And I have to ask, did you, you said you wrote that yourself? Wow. Did you guys enjoy that? I know you did because I did too. As he was reading his poem, I was thinking about the vision of MLK. And I'm like, Lord, we, we're actually here. We're actually sitting among each other, different colors, different race, loving each other. The exact vision that MLK envisioned. And I think it's just wonderful to look around the room. Maria Caratina, I, I, all, when I first met her, I called her my Mexican sister. And I love her. And we just, we didn't even really know each other. But that's what this is all about. You guys feel that? Don't you feel that love? Wow, that touched me. Do we have anyone in here who would like to piggyback on what he just shared? Is, is there something on your heart? Go ahead, come on. A long time, I was a slave to the things um, that hindered me in my past of abuse, of all kind of things, things that I've done wrong or things that people done wrong to me until I realized that I had to break those chains to, you know, in order to free myself. And that's wow. Wonderful. Wonderful, and thank you for sharing. I, I, I see it. I, I, I see it on you, and, and thank you for sharing, being bold and uh, brave enough to share that experience. For the sake of time, we need to move on. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Um, our next person will be Crystal Williams, Hidden Talents. Our, she is an Eastfield College student. Would you like my microphone? Or you want to use that? It's Kiska, like the mountain in Africa is Kiska, but it's spelled different. And um, my poem is called Choices, and I call myself Hidden Talents. And this is something I wrote years ago. And um, I call myself hidden talent because some people wouldn't know that some of the things that I've been through or was doing to myself or have done wouldn't know that I um, had this kind of, I call it a talent because um, you couldn't look at me and tell that I write poetry. And it's kind of choices because the same thing I said a lot of times people let things that happen to us or that we've done to each other hinder us from being, uh, you know, all that we can be or have potential. And 
we can't keep continue, continue to make excuses of being hurt or what other people have done to us or what we've done to other people. We have to forgive those and we have to forgive ourselves for the people uh, that we, things that we pe people through. So we have a choice now to you know change. Um, at, at one time we didn't have a choice, and this is why. We didn't choose to ride a boat from the motherland. We didn't choose to work for free and We didn't choose to end up hanging from trees. We didn't choose the moment we were set free. We didn't choose to shed the tears required. We didn't choose that hope would stay alive. We didn't choose that we are no longer kings and queens. We didn't have a chance to choose a lot of things. We didn't choose when a master bought a whip. We didn't choose the dirt we had to flip. We didn't choose the food we had to eat. We didn't choose the exhaustion of our bodies and feet. We didn't choose to fight on the front line. We didn't choose that we would live or die. We didn't choose that some of our friends were gone. We didn't choose to stay or come back home. We didn't choose the members of our family tree. We didn't choose to exist or even be. We didn't choose if our parents would stick around. We didn't choose if our father would ever be found. We didn't choose not to live uptown. We didn't choose that our feet are not on solid ground. We didn't choose that we could not pay for college. Some didn't choose to have limited knowledge. Choose life. Choose to be. Open your eyes and choose to provide choices for your destiny. Choose to strive. Choose to stay alive. Choose to choose. Choose to win, not lose. Wow. Woo. Come on, we got we to gotta give her another hand clap for that. Oh, my God. Woo. You know, this is my, my fifth year hosting. And I'm telling you, this year, my God, the, the talent is just really coming out of the seams. This is wonderful. That just really touched me. That, that was wonderful. And you wrote that. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We didn't choose. Wow. You're right. We didn't choose. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Thank you for that. Our next reading will be by Cy Armstrong, who is also an Eastfield College student. Thank you. My heart is pounding. I love this. George Douglas Johnson, born on September 10, 1810, in Atlanta, and moved to Washington, D.C. She published her first poem at the age of 36. She has, she holds, uh, she hold, she has, she has been died, her husband died, and she holds a series of jobs. Substitute in a public school, file clerk to support, a file clerk to support her two kids. She also on a house where she helped people um, to pursue their dreams and poetry. This poem represents the fear of kinds of black women bringing, ch bringing children into the world. The discontent, the resistance, the violence, and the pain that black people have to endure just to live in America. The poem also refers to a white police man as monster and tries to protect their children from them. Black woman. Don't knock at the door, little child. I cannot let you in. You know not what a word this is of cruelty and sin. Wait in the eternity until I come to you. The world is cruel. Cruel, child. I cannot let you in. Don't knock at my heart, little one. I cannot bear the pain 
of turning their ear to your call time and time again. You do not know the monster man inhabiting the earth. Be a steel, be a steel, precious child. I must not give you birth. Thank you. Oh. Did, did you enjoy that? I know you had to enjoy that. Brenda, that was nice, wasn't it? Ooh, what is like to be an African-American woman in this world today? Ooh, you'll never understand it until you walk in the shoes of an African-American woman. That was beautiful. That was breathtaking. I am a crybaby. Let me just tell you. I'm trying not to get emotional. Oh, my God. This, that was wonderful. Did you enjoy that? I know you did, because I did. Wow. Bridget Holyfield, another one of our Eastfield family staff. Please welcome her to the podium. Bridget Holyfield. Good morning. Oh, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Bridget Holyfield, and yeah, I um I always like to come here, whether I participate or not. I like to come to the reading. Today, I'm going to um, read about a young man named William Sidney Pitney Pittman, who was born um, in Alabama on August 21st, 1875. This is not a poem. So, I know all the rest of them have been. Pittman attended Tuskegee Institute, where he met Booker T. Washington, who became his protege and mentor. He completed programs in woodwork and architectural mechanical drawing in 1897. He then went on to attend Drexel Institute in Philadelphia, where he completed the five-year architect and mechanical drawing program in only three years. We're talking about a black man. Pittman graduated from Drexel and returned to Tuskegee where he taught. Later he moved to Washington, D.C. in 1905 and worked for African-American architect named John Lankford. He established his own office just a few months later. In the fall of 1906, he entered and won the competition to design the Negro building at the Jamestown Tricentennial Exposition. Pittman married Washington's daughter, Portia, in 1907 assuring him a permanent connection with his mentor. Pittman's major commissions while in Washington included the Garfield Elementary Public School and the 12th Street YMCA, a segregation facility for African Americans. Pittman relocated to Texas in 1912 after being awarded a series of contracts in the South. Many claim that he was Dallas' first African American architect. While in Texas, he designed a Carnegie-funded library in Houston and the Knights of Pythians Temple, located in the heart of Dallas Deep Ellum District at 2551 Elm Street. The building was completed in 1916, built in the electric bow art style, and stands as one of the few remaining non-religious structures in Dallas that was designed by an African-American architect. And if any of you know that area of Dallas, it used to be the Union Bankers Insurance uh, Company, um, but now it's kind of abandoned. But the temple served from 1916 to 1939 as a social, professional, and cultural center of the, of the center of the city's African American community. The temple hosted graduations, meetings, conventions, lectures by Marcus Garvey and George Washington Carver, as well as housed the Office of African American Doctors, Dentists, and other professionals in the area. The Golden Chain of the World, an organization similar to the Pythians, and the Negro Business Bureau also had offices there. In 1939, the Pythians were forced to sell. The building then became the Dallas Office Machine Company, and later the Union Bankers Insurance Company. Although unknown and forgotten at the time of his death, Many of his commissions have been identified and now stand as designated historic buildings. In 1989, the Knights of Pythians 
Temple Building located on Elm Street in Dallas, Texas became a historic landmark. The historian Susan G. Pearl wrote in 1994, Pittman was not an important architectural innovator, but because of his talent, ambition, and industry, William Sidney Pittman made a place for himself in a field that was just opening to African Americans. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Well, we have a few more read-ins, and my next read-in is my sister from another mother, Maria Canratini Frada, Eastfield College professor. Hey, sister. Hey, sister. I'm very short, so I don't know. Give me the shortest, shortest microphone you have. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? That's the whole story. Okay. Well, like one of the other authors who stood before you, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to read to you. I was born with a curiosity about languages. I had people in my family that I understood were from the Caribbean, were from Cuba, Puerto Rico, other little islands, and they all had these different accents, and they all had these, this different vocabulary. As a very young child, I would tune into what I would hear, and I would, my poor father, constantly bombard him with questions. How come uncle is Cuban? Okay, so he's Cuban, but he's not white, he's black. And he's Cuban, and then his Spanish, it doesn't sound like our Spanish, it sounds like somebody's beating a drum. Oh, and my father would say, well, you have to remember that African people were brought to the Caribbean. And they were brought to Cuba and Puerto Rico and Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And they do have this different way of speaking. And I said, but that's not the only thing. Because, for example, when grandma looks at our Cuban uncle, she says, Oye, negro. Oye, negro. ¿Qué quieres café? So why does she call him negro? Like, why can't she just use his name? Oh, because it's a term of endearment. Negro. Oh, negro. Okay, but dad. Okay, but then sometimes she says, Oye, negro, bembon. Ven pa' acá. What is bembon? Because, right, if like you say it a lot, like grandma says it when she gets mad, Negro bembon, negro bembon, negro bembon. It's like you're singing. Negro bembon, negro bembon. And my father would say, that's another term of endearment, bembon. And I was like, really? He says, yes. He says, but what does it mean? Oh, it means he has wider lips than you, right? Bembon, bembon. So that's why he's... Not only negro, he's negro bembon. Okay, Dad, I got that one. So, of course, I go off to college. My poor father, he couldn't answer all of the questions for me. And I started collecting books. And I picked this one, which I still have. It's published in 1971. Wonderful poet from Cuba, Nicolás Guillén. And what, to my surprise, there's a poem about Negro Bimbon. Now, there was also a song when I was in college that we used to listen to on the radio. I don't know if you remember hearing it ever, especially if you're from Mexico and you had Perez Prado. Mataron al Negro Bimbon, mataron al Negro Bimbon. Todo el mundo lo sabía, porque al negrito bembón, 
Todo el mundo lo quería, porque al negrito bembón, todo el mundo lo quería. I run back home. We go, Dad, I told you. It's African music in that Spanish. It's not just Spanish. It's African bongos and congas. That music came from Africa to the Caribbean, and it's in our Spanish. Then my father told me the truth. He said, sweetheart, it's not only in our Spanish, it's in our blood. <laughs> Look at your Cuban uncle. Look at your abuelita. You can't live in the Caribbean and say that you are white. You are not. So this little poem I grabbed, and it has been a part of my heart, and I haven't read this poem in years. But I told Brenda that I was going to go way back when. And this is 1930, 1930 in Cuba. Negro Bembon. Why do you get so angry when they call you Negro Bembon? ¿Por qué te pone tan bravo cuando te dicen Negro Bembon? Si tiene la boca santa, Negro Bembon. Bembón, así como eres, the way you are, tiene de todo. Caridad te mantiene, te lo da todo. They give you everything. Te queja todavía, negro bembón. Sin pega y con harina, negro bembón. Because negro bembón could go everywhere. And everywhere somebody would give him a little bit of flour, a little bit of water. He could make anything. He could make some cassava. He could make some bread. Negro bembon, zapato de do tono. The black and white shoes that Cubans wear to dance salsa. Negro bembon. Bembon, así como eres, that way that you are. Tiene de to. Caridad te mantiene. Life gives you. Te lo da todo. You have everything. Negro bembón. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I always enjoy Maria and her different languages and her, her different flavor that she brings to the American African reading. And I, I think it's great. Thank you for that piece. That was great. Did you guys enjoy that? Because I did. Yes. All right. We have two more read-ins for you. And our next, Johnny Mac, author and motivational speaker, Deacon, my brother, come to the podium. Wow. I'm going to adopt you. That was wonderful. You know, and all of you guys, man, this is powerful. I appreciate you guys for staying. Uh, I'm going to give a shameless uh, publicity commercial. I just published my uh, recent book, One Shade of Black. It'll be available on Amazon on March the 3rd, and it's uh, only $9.99. Pretty interesting uh, work. I was excited. My daughter said, Dad, if you don't write it, I'm going to be mad. So I wrote it so she wouldn't be mad. She just texted me. You know, Brenda um, has always invited me, and just like the rest of you, just the fact that for this annual event, I have the opportunity to stand before you. I'm excited, and it just it does me, just makes me happy. She said that the theme of today's uh, uh, presentation was the poetry of justice. And then she billed me as a motivational speaker and author. So daily I write a post um, on Facebook called The Magnificent Mindset. It's a motivational piece, so I'm going to motivate you because she's been trying to get some energy in this room, and the energy is important for, a, for an author, for a speaker, for a person who stands before you. So my t t yesterday I wrote, remember, you are what you say you are. If you are saying that you are broke and sad and don't measure up to the rest of the world, guess what? That is your reality. I challenge you to say that you are awesome and marvelously made. I challenge you to say that you are successful and a winner. Whatever you're saying to yourself about yourself is what you will see manifested in your life. So stop saying 
anything except that you are powerful and wonderful. So I'm going to read that. Poetic injustice. I'll just give you a little background since everybody wants to give backgrounds. I've known that I was going to do this for the last several months, and I've just procrastinated. Procrastination is the assassination of your destination. And so as I was waiting and said, I've got to do this last night. In the last couple of weeks, I've just been, it's just been so much that, that I've had to do. And my, my father passed me, I had to bury him. It's just so much that was going on. And I didn't get the chance to do anything, and I didn't want to disappoint my sister. So I said, I've got to come up with something that's going to be nice. And at, last night at 10 o'clock, I said, oops, it's tomorrow at 11. So I sat down and wrote Poetic Injustice. Our shining prince, who was the king, said, I have a dream, and I am that dream. I ate at segregated lunch counters and went to the back doors to restaurants. I picked cotton and prime tobacco. I went to black-only schools and drank from black-only fountains. I am that dream. I was bussed out of my community, the other places, and treated like something foreign. I am that dream. I was assimilated and liberated and forgot who I was. I fought to fit in, and once I got in, those that looked like me said I was no longer like them. I studied hard and prepared myself and became all they said I needed to be, and yet that was not enough. I am their dream. I lost my identity in a mad rush to be accepted, and I stopped accepting myself as I learned a new language and forgot how to speak to my people. I am that dream of new homes and communities and identity. I looked into a mirror. mirror called America, and didn't recognize myself. What is good about America? I have seen it. What is vile and horrible about America? I have seen it. I am that dream, and I still enjoy all that it is. I am Malcolm saying, by any means necessary. I am Langston saying, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. I am W.E.B. Du Bois being treated as three-fifths of a man with the Harvard degree and espousing the theory of the talented tent. I am George Washington Carver turning peanuts into a creamy treat, and Louis Latimer inventing the light bulb and telephone so that we can see and hear. I am Booker T. Washington pulling myself up by my own bootstraps. I am Benjamin Banneker laying out the nation's capital. I am Colonel Charles Young riding a mule from Ohio to D.C. to prove I'm fit. I am Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman leading cowards to freedom. I am Frederick Douglass and Phyllis Wheatley writing about misery in a land that denied me the ability to read and called me dumb. I am Dred Scott, disemancipated, forced back into slavery because of a wrong decision. I am four bomb black little girls in Sunday school on a break from police dogs and water hoses. I am Kunta Kenta and Shaka Zulu standing up to be knocked down and yet I rise. I am Dr. Maya Angelou and Nikki Giovanni and Sonia Sanchez and Alex Haley and Tony Morrison and Alex Baldwin and the last poets in the Renaissance and the Jim Crow South going in back doors, yet I'm the help cooking and cleaning and baking chocolate pies for my special recipe and holding my water and raising porcelain babies and growing up to be, to, to be growing up to be privileged princesses of a junior league that puts me under siege. I am poetic injustice, and still I rise, like Marcus and Malcolm and Martin and Obama. My history is written in poetry, and the poets are the historians of our times. It's poetic injustice that today, black-on-black -black crime happens every time a brother tries to rise, and there's no rhyme or reason for the treason that separated me from my family in the name of Southern commerce. And I ain't angry. I just ain't happy. And yet today, you are angry? Please. <laughs> wow. Wow. That was wonderful. Can we all say, I am somebody? I am somebody. I am the head and not the tail. All right. Our next African American read in, which is our last who comes faithfully every year. And we just want to stand up and give you a round of applause, Dr. Willene Owens, Looper, and Skyline students. Come on, let's give it up for the students. These are students 
These students take time out every year to come out from high school. Black power! Yes. Black power! Black power! Power to the people. Power to the people. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you something about uh, Malcolm X. Uh, right there. A quote he said. Uh, I'm going to start now. Uh, he said, you make my point. <laughs> That is all as a white man does it, it is all right. A black man is supposed to have no feelings. So when a black man strikes back, he's an extremist. He's supposed to sit passively and have no feelings, be nonviolent, and love his enemy. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. power to the people. Uh, this is like some uh, words I wrote myself about Malcolm X, what I like, got out of it. I said, Malcolm X is a big contributor to Black History Month. He was a great leader. He believed that violent, violence was the way. He believed in retaliation is how to solve your problems. I believe that you shouldn't act as violent. In, shouldn't act as violent is the answer. Also, Malcolm X of violence later had him assassinated. He was a smart man. I didn't agree with what he did all the time, but he fought for what he believed in and made him a big contributor to our Black History Month. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Rashard, uh, Skyline School. Uh, my teacher, she asked everybody, what has Malcolm X contributed to the society? I answered, Malcolm X's contribution to society was underscoring the price of a free population by showing the great lengths to which human beings would go to secure their freedom. Power in defense of freedom is greater than power in behalf of tyranny and oppressions. He said, because power, real power, comes from our conviction, which produces action, uncompromising action. Black power. Black power! <laughs> Black power. Black power. Power to the people. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Jasmine Young, and I am a junior at Skyline High School. Um, I'm going to read to you the things that I think of when I hear Malcolm X and a poem later after it. When I think of Malcolm, I think of I'm me. I believe. No one is more nor less than I am. Stand up for what you believe in. We shouldn't be judged by our moral beliefs. Don't give up. Keep achieving. Show the world you are somebody. Now I'll be reading to you a poem by Jahari Amani called St. Malcolm. The prophet speaks. His images disseminate. Stripping, facade, and the dream stands naked. Visibly before creation, as a nightmare and a truth of breast grasping men. Prophecy is silence of necessity as nightmares erupt in fulfillment. El Haj Malik El Shabazz martyrized, but his word characterized our infection, unifying blackness. Black power. Black, Black power. power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Power to the people. Power to the people. Um, hello, my name. My name is Jelani Brown. I'm a senior at the Great Skyline High School. I will be graduating this year. Uh, I kind of like to stand out more of my knowledge than bright colors, so it's kind of why I'm black down. I used to, I'm going to uh, go off of these sad procrastination is uh, assassination of my destination. I really like that because that's kind of what I do. I tend to procrastinate a whole bunch. Um, today I will be reading a poem titled Liberated. And when I say liberated, you can all feel free to just say free. That is, it'll really help me. Um, liberated. Free. I am free from you. Liberated. Free. Bondage is through. Liberated. Free. I'll speak my view. Liberated. Free. Life to pursue. Oh, come and hear the news. I am now free to choose. There is no more abuse. 
one of the Losom Blues. Because I am liberated. Free. I am free from you. Liberated. Free. Bondage is through. Liberated. Free. I will speak my view. Liberated. Free. Life to pursue. An end to oppression, freedom of expression. There will be no concession. Gone is the depression. Because I'm liberated. Free. I am free from you. Liberated. Free. Bondage is through. Liberated. Free. I will speak my view. Liberated. Free. Life to pursue. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a sophomore at Skyline High School, Rainy Shoy. When we look at other parts of this earth upon which we live, we find that black, brown, red, and yellow people in Africa and Asia are getting their independence. They're not getting it by singing, we shall overcome. No, they're not getting it through, no, they're getting it through nationalism. It is nationalism that brought about the independence of the people in Asia, and we will take black nationalism to bring about the freedom of 22 million Afro-Americans here in this country. We have suffered colonialism for the last, for the past 400 years. Now I'm going to read a poem by Malcolm X. It is just like when you got some coffee that's too black, which means it's too strong. What you do, you integrate, you integrate it with cream, you make it weak. But if you pour too much cream, you forget you ever had coffee. It, it used to be hot, it, used to, it becomes cool. It used to be strong, but it becomes weak. It used to wake you up, now it puts you to sleep. Black power. Black power! Black power. Black power! Black power. power to the people. Hi. Hi. <laughs> My name is Edward Lawson. I'm a freshman at Skyline. And I'm going to read you something about Malcolm X. Okay. Malcolm X is one of those people that succeeded in, challenge, in changing mental mentality of the big minorities of black people in urban ghettos. These people were suffering under racial injustice. Let me define unjust, unjust treatment by the ruling pure on, on the ground of hate and fear both generated by the prejudice of race. Being treated unfairly leaves every human being two options, accept or deny. Now, and these quotes inspired me. We cannot think of being acceptable to others until we have first proven acceptable to ourselves. And people don't realize how a man's whole life can be changed by one book. Black power. 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 Power to the people. Good afternoon. My name is Charles Lynch. I'm a freshman from uh, Skyline High School. Uh, today I'm going to be reading two quotes or speeches from Malcolm X. One is an autobiography and I guess another speech that he said that inspired me. Uh, and after that, I'm going to express how these two speeches inspired me or how they touched me. And because I had been a hustler, I knew better than all whites knew and better than are better than nearly all of the black leaders knew that actually the most dangerous black man in America was the ghetto hustler. Why do I say this? The hustler out there in the ghetto jungles has less respect for the white power structure than any other Negro in North America. The ghetto hustler is internally restrained by nothing. He has no religion, no concept of morality, or no civic responsibility. No fear, nothing. To survive, he is out there constantly preying upon others, hoping for any human weakness like a fairy. The ghetto hustler is forever frustrated, restless, and anxious for some action. Whatever he undertakes, he commits himself to it fully, absolutely. What makes the ghetto hustler yet more dangerous is his glamour image to the school dropout, youth in the ghetto. The ghetto teenagers see the hell called by their parents struggling to get somewhere, or see that they have given up struggling in the prejudice and tired of a white man's world. The ghetto teenagers make up their own minds. They would rather be like the hustlers whom they see dressed up, sharp, and flashing money and displaying no respect for anybody or anything. 
So the ghetto youth become attracted to the hustler worlds of dope, thievery, prostitution, and general crime and immortality. And another thing that he said was, the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. These two touched me because growing up, I've experienced or seen a lot of things that he has said or that he has been through, so I know exactly where he comes from. And when he said the future belongs to those who prepare for it today, is that if you don't have a plan for what you're going to do tomorrow, then there's nothing that you can really do for it. Thank you. Black power. 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 Power to the people. Power to the people. Black power. A movement in support of rights and political power. I'm for truth, no matter who tells it. I'm for you. I'm for me. So I thank you, Malcolm X. Thank you, Detroit Red. Thank you, Malcolm Little. Thank you, El-Haj Malik El-Shabazz. Thank you, African American. Thank you, minister. Thank you, human rights activist. Thank you, courageous advocate for the rights of blacks. Thank you, Pan-African connector. I choose to remember your transformation. I choose to remember how you fought against what you thought was wrong and you stood for what you thought was right. You had some harsh words, but you were fighting a harsh enemy. So thank you to one of the greatest and most influential African Americans in history. I celebrate 39 years of you on this earth, May 19, 1925 to February 21, 1965. And I celebrate how tall you stood. I'm not just talking about being six foot four inches. I'm talking about how you could hold your head up high despite adversity. And I can do the same. And I can teach these young people to do the same. Many young people feel so far removed from the civil rights experience. In fact, one of my students, as we were studying Malcolm X in the past week, said, I, I hate Malcolm X. I don't like him. But what I wanted them to do is not only just to say, well, that was then and this is now, but I wanted them to participate in reading. So you heard some of the young people's opinions. They may not have all came together exactly perfectly, but the point of the matter is they're thinking, and that's what's important. Because I've questioned the slave experience. I've questioned the civil rights experience, and I've questioned the Malcolm X experience, and it influences my current thinking. So I've been motivated, and I hope these young people have as well, to research, to study, and to continue to learn, lest we forget. Black power. 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 power to the people. I close with my favorite poem from Langston Hughes, and I modified it a little, Mother to Son. Now that I'm a teacher and I have 180 sons and daughters in my class, this poem is so much more powerful to me. And this adapted poem is dedicated to Malcolm X. Well, Brother Malcolm, I'll tell you, life for you wasn't no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it. It had splinters in it and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor. Bad. But all this time, you still inspire us to keep climbing on and turning corners and reaching landings. And sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So Brother Malcolm, you taught me not to turn back. And I'm teaching others not to sit down on them steps because we find it's kind of hard. Ooh, we can't fall now. We got to keep on going, honey. Keep climbing on. Even when life ain't been no crystal stair.